Hello, Nick family. Welcome to my channel, Dope Soul Sports Talk. The next few videos, I'm going to give you my takes on the Knicks 2021 season. I'm going to start today with the starters, the late starters. This doesn't include Kemba. I'll talk about him in a separate video. I'll do a video on IQ and Obi. I'll do a video on the rookies. I'll do a video on those who played less than half a season. And then, of course, I'm going to do a video on the front office and the coaching staff. So let's get right into it. Starting at the top of the food chain with Julius Randle. Last year, he averaged 24 points, 10 rebounds, 6 assists, six assists shot 45.6% from the field, 41% from three, 81% from the free throw line. This year, 20 points, 10 rebounds, 5 assists, only 41% from the field, 31% from three, 76% there about from the free throw line. I think if you just look at his raw numbers, looks like a good season, right? He's not that far off from last season. You can argue with the addition of Kimba and Fournier, it's to be expected that his numbers would go down. Only went down four points, not that bad. But if you've watched Julius Randle, as most of us did, game in and game out, you know he was a different player. In the beginning of the season, there was games he would take four shots, nine shots, just really looked out of sorts. You can argue that he was just finding his way with his new teammates. I'll take that. He looked a little better as the season went on, but overall, he just wasn't very efficient. And that was the difference in his game from last year to this year. And that's a big difference. So at the rim, he shot 60% last year and 60% this year. But he ranked 134 among bigs last year, finishing at the rim, and this year 143 for the 16th percentile in both years. So we we often talk about wanting to see him in the post, wanting to see him go to the rim. But he's not a very good finisher at the rim, to be honest, compared to his in his to his peers. In the mid range last year, he shot 43 percent. This year, 36 percent. He ranked 67th. Um, amongst his peers last year at Biggs, this year 118, 31st percentile. So his mid-range was down as well. And in threes, this was the big one. Last year, he, sh he shot 41% from three. This year, 31. He was ranked 64 amongst Biggs last year, 138 this year. He was in the 91st percentile last year, just the 30th percentile this year. Didn't shoot as well. We saw that, but he also wasn't as clutch. He came up really big in the fourth quarters for us last year. Him and Rose hit those big shots in the last two, three, four, five minutes of the game when we were within reach, either up or down. He hit some really key shots for us. This year, we did not have a closer. He, Rose wasn't here. Obviously, he was injured. But Julius Randle also did not come through for us um, in the clutch. But we could talk about his, his game. We could talk about his inefficiency. But I think the biggest change in his game for me was his lack of energy, his lack of engagement, his effort was hit or miss. Some games he was engaged um, offensively and defensively and other games he just, you know, he just wasn't. And then we also have to look at what I'm calling his emotionality, just the difficulty honing his emotions when he's frustrated, when he's not getting a call, really not plugged into what's going on in the game and how this is not a good time to get a tech. This is not a good time to implode. You know, I've seen players get frustrated, but they know how to come back to the present moment. And that just wasn't Julius Randle. And I think going forward, more so than his game, because you've heard me talk before that I can work with his inefficiencies. Well, not me, but I think the team can work with his inefficiencies, right? You can construct a team where he has less playmaking, less decision-making responsibilities, right? You can construct a team where he's getting the ball in his spots, right? But his emotionality, what are you going to do with that? You can't count on him and you can't have a player on your team that you can't count on. I'm big on that. I don't like injury prone players because you can't count on them. I prefer a, a low, a high floor guy 
over a guy with a high ceiling who's extremely inconsistent, right? And I don't like guys that are emotionally unstable. Now, I don't mind you being an emotional guy. Pat Beverly is an emotional guy. I would love him on the Knicks. But where you can't bring it back in when you need to, when it's hurting the team. I think Tibbs and the front office not holding Julius accountable has something to do with it as well. They're, you know, you have to look at them also. I'm not saying that they didn't talk to him behind the scenes. But if you see that talk is not working, you have to sit him down. You have to. Just to let him know, listen, we spoke to you about it. We gave you an opportunity to change your behavior. You didn't. We're not going to allow you to impact this team where we can't count on you. Sit down right here. And if you really want to play, and I believe Randall does, I think he would have got the message, right? I don't think it's only on Tibbs. I think it's also on the front office. A lot of times when a coach tries to hold a player accountable, you've got to make sure in this player-friendly era that the front office is behind you on that. So as far as him coming back, listen, if he can't hone his emotions, I think we need to move on from him if we can get a good return. Again, we can work with his game. I believe that. I know a lot of fans don't believe we can, but we can't work with that emotionality. So if the Knicks, if if he can't change that, I think we need to move on from him, see if we can find a starter. I, I don't want to get back just draft capital. I would like to get back a starter plus draft capital. I don't know if his value is high enough for that, but if you can't shape up, I think we need to, you know, I think we need to move on from Julius Randle. All right. And let's move on right here. R.J. Barrett. R.J. Barrett last year in 35 minutes averaged 17.6 points, six rebounds, three assists, shot 44.1% from the field, 40% from three, pretty much 75% from the line. This year, Comparable minutes, 34.5 minutes, 20 points, 5.8 rebounds, 3 assists. Only shot 41% from the field, 34% from 3, 71.4% from the free throw line. But in my opinion, R.J. Barrett took a step. He took a step in terms of his mentality. I know there's some that'll look at, oh, he scored 20 points a game. But you can argue with his lack of efficiency that he really didn't take a step in terms of his raw numbers, right? You can even argue that he regressed because he had to take more shots because of the lack of efficiency to get to 20 points a game. The step for me that's most important with R.J. Barrett was his assertiveness. I thought early in the season, the, if, the, if the game comes to me, it comes to me. If it doesn't, it doesn't. At one point, something just clicked in R.J. Barrett and he became much more aggressive. You know, looking for his shot, looking for his opportunities. And I think when Tibbs saw that, I think he started to now put him in better positions to score the ball. Now, you can argue he should have been doing that. Ben did that, you know, and maybe had he done that, R.J. Barrett would have popped sooner. Maybe, you know, but maybe Tibbs is the type of coach where I need to see it first. And if I see it first, then I'm going to change things. And I think the offense changed. I think you saw him in different positions on the court. You saw him playmaking, bringing the ball down, in transition, initiating the offense. And I thought he did pretty well. Now, R.J. Barrett is also another inefficient player. Let's go over those numbers. At the rim, he shot 55% this year. His first year, he shot 54% at the rim. Second year, 55%. This year, 55%. He was ranked 85th at the wing position his first year, 89th his second year, and 94th. Um, he was ranked 94th this year. In terms of his percentile, 22nd percentile, first year, 24th percentile, the third year, and only the 15th percentile, which is very low for the wing position, finishing at the rim. I was really surprised about that because it looked to me that he was getting better at finishing at the rim. He definitely took more attempts this, this season. He seemed to be finishing with his right, finishing with his left. He seemed to look better. But in terms of his ranking at the rim, 
He finished in the 15th percentile, just 55% at the rim. In the mid-range this year, just 33%. He ranked 91 for the wing position and again finished in the 17th percentile, which is very low. He did better last year. He finished in the 32nd percentile. His rookie year, he was in the 14th percentile from the mid-range. As far as the three-point shooting, he shot 35% this year. He ranked 75 amongst wings, and he was in the 34th percentile, which is decent. From non-corner threes, he was 35.7% right there with Buddy Hill, right there with um, Duncan Robinson. Shout out to Clean the Glass for the stats. So R.J. Barrett needs to clean up his efficiency. He needs to get better at the rim, in the mid-range, in the three-point shooting. So I'm not encouraged by R.J. Barrett by looking at his numbers. That, that doesn't do it for me. Matter of fact, you can get discouraged looking at the numbers. But when you watch him play, he's a keeper for the Knicks, in my opinion. Now, obviously, if you're going to get a better tra tra player, you have to move on from him. And that's for anybody on the Knicks. That's for anybody in the NBA. But I really believe R.J. Barrett is a building block for the Knicks. He wants to get better. He works at it. You see budding leadership skills and R.J. Barrett. I'm encouraged by him. Now, the other thing I'm encouraged by, and I meant to mention this, was that 46-point game against Miami, a very good team, top 10 defensive team, and also versus L.A. You know, when he scored those clutch baskets to push overtime, those are the signs you're looking for in a young player, not just what they're doing, how much they're scoring, but when they're doing it. And those two games really stood out for me. And there were others. Now, the Knicks can offer him an extension this summer. You know, we did a whole show on MBK on whether or not R.J. Barrett is worth the max extension. Um, we actually did keep him or dump him again on MBK, R.J. Barrett the other day, and the max extension came up. I'm on record. I'm not giving R.J. Barrett five years, $181 million. I just don't think he's that guy yet. But why can't we wait? We don't have to sign him to an extension um, this offseason. Why can't we go into next season, let him play, see if he takes yet another step, and then if he does, offer the max extension? He's not going to get that money. Even if he signs the contract this summer, he has a, up, up until October to sign it. It's not going to kick in until the next season, right? So that the 2023, 2024 season is when it is when it kicks in. So unless you're going to get him for much less this off season, if he's pushing for the max, let it ride out. See how he plays. You want the max. We don't think. You're a max player right now. You you know, let's see you for another year, you know, and see what happens. So for me, I'm playing. If I can get RJ Barrett at 100 million five years, I'll definitely do it. I don't think he's going for that. 25 million a year, um, um, I, I would do it. 36 million a year on average, which is what the max contract is. He's just not that guy yet. And unfortunately, they have to make a decision before he proves he's that guy, it you know, it seems like. So that's not something um, I would do, but I think they're going to come to a compromise. I think it does get done. I don't think he gets to restricted free agency. Moving right along, Evan, um, Evan Fournier. I've said this before, Evan Fournier did what the Knicks brought him in to do. In 30 minutes, he averaged 14 points, 2.2 rebounds, 2.6 assists. He shot 41.7 from the field, 38.9% from three-point land, and shot 71% from the free throw line. His numbers were down compared to, as you can see, his 2021 um, season numbers that he split between Orlando and Boston. He was another inefficient player, right? So we had RJ, we, we have Randall, we have Evan Fournier, all in that 40, 41% field goal range. It That's part of the reason why the Knicks weren't more successful. This is a shot-making league, and the Knicks just were not hitting shots. So when I say he did what they wanted him to do is that 
he stretched the floor. You had to respect him when he was in the corner. So that gave RJ and Randall a little more room to operate. Fournier can do more than just hit shoot threes, right? He can put the ball on the floor. He can shoot off the, he can shoot in the mid range, but we just didn't use him that way. And, you know, for whatever reason, you know, maybe Tibbs thought, you know, you got RJ that needs the ball. You got Randall that needs the ball. We don't need not another player that needs the ball. And I ain't even, we didn't even get to IQ yet. Just hit the three for us. And he did that. He took more threes um, this season than he ever did. And he broke the Knicks single season three point made record. You know, it took him a while to find his place. But then when he did, he killed it. However, the efficiency just wasn't there. Now, in times, in terms of next season, should we bring him back? Should we move on from him? It depends on the direction of the Knicks. If the Knicks are saying we want to go young, we're not really worried about the playoffs. We're just worrying about developing our young players, giving them those minutes. Then I think you move on from Evan Fournier, right? However, if you can, if you can trade him. However, if you still, if you're trying to make the playoffs next season, he's not a bad guy to have on your team because he can shoot the three. And trust me, he will be better next season, right? So it depends on what the Knicks are thinking. I don't think the Knicks are trying to go young. Leon Rose talked about being disappointed that they didn't make the playoffs, that they didn't, they expected to take the next step and it didn't happen. They were at the Dallas-Utah um, playoff game. I don't think they was there for personal reasons. It was a business trip, right? So whether they were looking at Brunson, whether they were looking at Donovan Mitchell, who knows? But they were working, right? That's not the movement of a team that's looking to stay pat. So we'll see how it, how it, you know, how it all plays out. Moving right along, Alec Burke. Alec Burke last season, 13 points, five rebounds, two assists, shot 42% from the field, 41.5% from three, 85.6% from the free throw line. This year in 28.6 minutes, his minutes was up due to the injuries to Kemba and Rose and him being thrust into that starting lineup. 12 points, five rebounds, three assists, 39.1% from the field. Again, yet another player in that 39, 40, 41% field goal range. You can't win like that. Shot 40% from the three, which is really good, at 82.2% from the free throw line. He played out of position. He did not play well. I don't think him not playing well was due to the fact that he was out of position. I just think he was in a very long slump. When he's on, he's going to hit the three for you. He's going to play this decent defense. You know, he'll have a stat line like, I don't know, 15 points, five rebounds, three assists, a steal two to three three-pointers. That's Alec Burke when he's on, you know? But that's not Alec Burke every night, you know? And when you put him in the starting lineup, you're expecting that type of production every night. He just wasn't able to do that. He was out of his role. I mean, I guess if you want to say it had a little something to do with it, I'll go with that. But for the most part, I just thought that he was in a really long slump until about the end of the season. In terms of him going back, I think if you're a playoff team, you want an Alec Burke on your team, somebody who's going to come off the bench. He can get really hot. He's a clutch shooter. We saw that last year. He won some games for us, brought us back in some games that we seem to be out of. He's that type of player. But again, where are the Knicks going? Where are the Knicks going? If you're talking about, you know, letting these young guys rock, marinate, as some would say, then you got to move off of um, you got to move off of Alec Burke. Now, I'm a believer that if you're a young player, we we don't have to clear the runway for you. I believe Cam Reddish should be able to beat Alec Burks out in training camp. You know, I know there are some that says even if he does, <laughs> Tibbs may give the position to Alex Burks anyway. Possible, but I really believe that. Cam Reddish should be able to beat out Alec Burks. Now, this is the thing with Cam Reddish, and we'll talk about him, you know, um, a little more in, in another in another video, is he has a high ceiling, but how consistent is he? You know, 
I ask this question a lot. Why did Atlanta choose um, DeAndre Hunter over Cam Reddish, who has so much upside? And Tony Crow, shout out to Tony Crow, my co-host from um, the crossover on NBK Network, said because he had a high floor, some teams like high floors. All right. I mean, maybe, maybe that was it. But if Cam Reddish is what we think he is, he should be able to beat out Alec Burks in training camp. I don't think we have to clear the runway so we can give him an opportunity to see what he can do. No, you beat the guy out and then we know we need to move on from this guy. He's better. So we need to move him to the bench. We need to move him out of the rotation. We need to trade him. Or before the season, you say, you know what? I think Cam is ready. I think he's ready to be a starter. Let's move on from Burks now. And that's for any position. But this idea, let's just clear the deck, put them in, and see what they can do. I just don't see games as a training ground. Don't get me wrong. If you've earned it and you're ready, absolutely, you're going to be able to develop with playing time, right? You can't duplicate game speed. But the idea of just moving people on just to see if you're ready, you know, I don't I don't know about that. But like, again, if Cam Reddish is who we think he is, he should be able to beat out Alec Burks in training camp, whether Alec Burks is here or not. All right. And last but not least, let's talk about Mitchell Robinson. Last year, he only played 36 games last year, 28 minutes, 8.3 points, 8.1 rebounds, one and a half blocks, 65.3% from the field, only 49% from the free throw line. This year, I think he played like 70 games, I want to say. I'm not quite sure about that. 25.7 points, eight and a half rebounds, eight point, excuse me, eight and a half points, 8.6 rebounds, 1.8 blocks. 76.1% from the field, and the free throw shooting got a little worse, 48.6% from the free throw line. Listen, Mitch came into the season coming off an injury. I don't believe he was 100%. He had he added more muscle weight. I think it was too much for him. As the season went on, he dropped some of the weight, seemed like the, his, his injury was healing, getting better, and he started to round into shape and look like the Mitch that we, that we know him to be. There were games when Mitchell Robinson dominated. He was just an elite defensive player, like 13 points, 17 rebounds, three blocks, really altering shots. And you would, and I would be like, wow, if this is Mitchell Robinson, if this is who he's going to be every game, we can't let, we can't let him go. And then the next game or two or three games afterwards, He's back to being pedestrian Mitch. Seven points, six rebounds, some games, no blocks. And that's the thing with Mitchell Robinson. You don't know what you're going to get. This is his fourth year. I expect a little more consistency. At the end of the day, he's averaging eight and a half points, eight and a half rebounds, two blocks. How much do you want to play for that? How much do you want to bet that he's going to continue to ascend and get better? And that's what the Knicks have to decide when it comes to Mitch, you know, and it's a tough decision. I think them playing Jericho Sims after the all-star break, I think that was part of it. Let's get a good look at him just in case these negotiations go sour. We want to know what we have, you know, I don't think Sims has this, have this, has the ceiling that Mitchell Robinson has but he does some things Mitchell Robinson just can't do. And that's move his feet on the perimeter, almost like a guard, you know? Um, so it's going to be a tough decision from the Knicks. I'm okay. If they resign Mitchell Robinson, I'm okay. If they move on from Mitchell Robinson, because from what he's given us right now, eight points, eight rebounds, a block and a half, you can get that. You know, I think the thing is with Mitch, you think about if he ever hits his ceiling, that's where you're like, I don't know if I want to let this out the door because if he hits his ceiling, that contract, that $54 million is going to be pennies, right? And so that's the that's the decision that, um, that the Knicks have to make. We also have to keep in mind he's a poor free throw shooter. 
you know, 49% last year, 49% this, this year, four years in the league. And I know some will argue it wasn't a full four because he's been injured multiple times throughout his time here. Exactly. Exactly. You know, that's, that's part of it, you know, as well. One thing I forgot to, to mention Mitchell Robinson is an elite offensive rebounder. He's ranked first in offensive rebounds in the league and top three in putback points per game, right? For whatever reason, we have a difficult time finding seven foot jumping bean, long arm Mitchell Robinson for lobs. And he has to generate his own points. And he does a great job at that on the offensive boards. Number one in the in the entire league um, with such a low usage rate, right? Um, and also the time he plays, 26, more than the usage rate, his minutes per game, 26 minutes per game. Um, and then also, you know, just not, not passing the ball to him, you know? So he generates his own points. He does a great job uh, on those offensive boards. I would like him to get better on the defensive boards. I mentioned this multiple times. If we move on from Randall, we start Obi. Obi is not a great rebounder. I think he'll get better if he stops leaking out. I think he will be better. But Mitch, I think half of Mitchell Robinson's rebounds are offensive rebounds. You know, so he needs to get better on the defensive end. That's all I got today, ladies and gentlemen. This is my take on the starters. I'll do IQ and OB and my next video. This is where you can find me on Twitter at BKSteph33. Email me at BKSteph33 at gmail.com. I'm interested in collaborating um, and creating shows with other content creators. I'm on the Queens Court Monday evenings on the Nothing But Knicks channel. And I also do the crossover with my co-host Tony Crow Wednesday evenings again on the Nothing But Nick channel. Be sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe to the channel. Peace, fam. Appreciate you.